Hi, I'm Lee Nicewander. Thank you for coming back for the Gold Lab Symposium for our afternoon session today. I just want to remind you that um, you can put questions in the question and answer chat um, and on the on the website. And so without further ado, I'd love to uh, introduce our first speaker of the afternoon, Michael Rosbash. Um, he's a professor of biology and neuroscience at Brandeis University and an HHMI investigator. And he studies the really interesting circadian rhythms, essentially what is the clock that underlies things like our behavior and our metabolism and our wake sleep cycle um, throughout the day and night. And he, um, for this work in 2017, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. And so um, I'm really looking forward to this. As Larry said in his introduction, uh, Michael's sense of humor is, is well known. And so I suspect his talk is going to be really interesting as well as informative. And so sit back and enjoy. Thank you very much, Leslie and, and Larry. Uh, for inviting me, I should I should say that I've wanted to attend this symposium for since it, since it first began. And Larry's good friend and my good friend Alan Jacobson came back, and every year he tells me what a fantastic symposium it is, and I have to control my envy. Uh, and, and finally, 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 somebody invited me to attend. And of course, it's the year pandemic year and so forth. But I'll take it. It's better than no. Uh, invitation whatsoever. The introduction about my sense of humor, I must say, um, <clears throat> reminded me of, of uh, Adrian Bird, who about 30 years ago, I was at a meeting with him. Uh, and in the bar, he was the last speaker in a session. And he was hysterically funny, this this very dry British sense of humor. And, and uh, everybody said how wonderful and how funny his work was. And he said to me, I wish somebody would compliment me on my science and not just my sense of humor. And then I tend to add <clears throat> insult to injury, if I can use that expression. I asked Alan Jacobson, <clears throat> what should I do? Uh, wanting really to give a stand-up talk or something like that. And Alan said, no, you've got to do it straight. There are really scientists from all over Boulder and social scientists, really people who want to learn. And so I, I am going to do this straight, at least uh, to the extent to which I'm, uh, I am capable. Okay, so <clears throat> circadian rhythms. I, I am, however, going to be begin with one um, Boulder-centric uh, <clears throat> anecdote, and you'll see in a moment why it's Boulder-centric. So this is a letter on my wall from me to Jim Watson, and actually there's a companion letter, which I won't belabor and bore you with, but, um, but the main point of this letter was to admonish Watson for having... Um, insulted me in public at, um, in, in no uncertain terms, at a Cold Spring Harbor meeting when I was a chair and there was a misunderstanding that took place and, and he got up uh, and, and uh, absolutely ripped me to shreds. I wasn't there at the moment. And uh, I was furious at, at uh, the extent to which he was drew. Uh, and so I wrote him this letter um, telling him that he had, he had, it was never a justification to treat somebody so badly. And so, so a night or two later, I was having dinner with, with Tom Check, and uh, Tom said, well, what did he say? And I said, well, in front of everybody, he got up and he said that um, given, given the, um, uh, the poor quality of my science, um, he wasn't surprised that, that I did something so stupid in informing the uh, the rest of the attendees about uh, clearing out uh, the auditorium, and uh, and Tom, in inimitable fashion, uh, said to me, uh, "Gee, do you think he was talking about your RNA work or your circadian work?" <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> and so the the, uh, the 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 point of the story is, of course, that it's the people you meet along the way who are really memorable. And uh, that 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 make this business of science and uh, seeking truth so so enjoyable. So, circadian rhythms onto something serious. So, this is a definition. Uh, the The word comes from Latin circa dia, about a day, and that's because the rhythms are not precisely twenty four hours, 
there's sometimes 23 or 25. And, and the purpose of these rhythms is to anticipate, to know what's going to happen. The early bird gets the worm, and the early worm avoids being eaten by the bird. And there's, of course, some organizational principles that also um, are governed by rhythms. And the way they get to be 24 hours exactly, and the way we get to be 24 hours, is, is because these not exact rhythms can be reset every day by the light-dark cycle. And um, this story, uh, and to some extent, uh, the, the historical um, description um, sort of is, is the, the advice of how to do this is uh, given here by the white rabbit. And so I'm gonna do um, exactly as, as uh, he or she recommends. And so here's the beginning. Um, the, the, the first two pieces of Genesis are less interesting. You know, darkness was upon the earth and so forth and so on. But you can see here that it was known a long time ago that this light-dark cycle was really important um, and is really the beginning of everything. And its um, circadian rhythms arose as adaptations to the uh, rotation of the earth so that different things would happen uh, at nighttime and in the daytime. And of course, the purpose of anticipation is not just to respond to the changes in illumination, but to actually um, anticipate them. And so to segue uh, from Jack's talk, um, the, the reducing atmosphere that he was describing uh, in which probiotic life arose was, was followed by um, cyanobacteria, this photosynthetic bacterium, which is really acknowledged to be responsible for oxygenation of the atmosphere between two and three billion years ago. And that's how we went from that reducing atmosphere to something that's much more hospitable to contemporary organisms. And the, the, the clock mechanism itself, the timekeeping mechanism, is completely different in bacteria, in those cyanobacteria, and in animals, and probably completely different in plants, too, although that's a little more, that's somewhat debatable. And so the fact that one has really different clocks with no connectors, no molecular um, relationship, uh, really suggests that, that the, the circadian mechanism has arisen multiple times uh, in evolution, underscoring its importance that bacteria did it, and then, and then animals, the precursor to animals, did it all over again. And uh, the, the plant, there's, a, there's an apocryphal or an, uh, an interesting piece of lore, circadian lore, that's, uh, that has to do with plants, and that is that this uh, astronomer did what's generally attributed to be the first experiment in this field. He took plants down to his wine cellar under constant conditions, and the leaf movements of plants, where the leaves retract and extend every day uh, in, under, under what would seem to be driven circumstances by the light-dark cycle, continued uh, in his wine cellar. And so that, that argued, he argued that 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 meant it must be an endogenous timing mechanism that's only entrained by the light cycle and not doesn't require the light cycle to drive it. So here's a quote from one of our great pioneers of molecular biology, one that I um, think has a lot um, of truth to it. New techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas, probably in that order. I think the importance here is how ideas last and, and techniques and discoveries um, in, in front of that. And locomotor activity is an assay. This is a very old slide you'll note because the hamster, which is in that running wheel, is connected to a chart recorder um, before uh, computers existed. And, and the point here is that the, the activity record of this hamster shown here over seven days in constant darkness um, is extremely regular. And in fact, the period is a little bit less than 24 hours. You can see every day begins a little earlier than the day before and ends a little bit earlier. But if that animal is in a light-dark cycle here, then it's, it's 
uh, its activity rhythm is entrained so that it is precisely 24 hour rhythms. And of course, this, this raises uh, the genetics mantra, which is like real estate and location, 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 except ours is phenotype, phenotype, phenotype. And the great thing about this phenotype and the reason I argue that it's really a discovery is because one can select single in individual animals and assay them and then breed them, something that's almost uh, unheard of in behavioral science where people have to work with populations and can't really pick out a single animal because the spread, the variance in the phenotype is too great. Well, circadian rhythms have a very precise phenotype. And we can do exactly the same kind of an assay in Drosophila where a single fly runs back and forth in a tube between the food and the stopper. And one can put a beam, a beam device, a measuring device across the middle of the tube and then measure that animal's uh, sleep-wake profile in the same way. And it's really 50 years ago, almost exactly, that Kanopka and Benzer applied genetics to this problem and isolated the wonderful period mutants, the three alleles of the period gene, which one of which was short period, one was long period, one was completely arrhythmic. And, and just to, uh, to connect uh, a bit to um, the point about, um, uh, from the somologic talk about uh, hypothesis-driven science, genetics is really hypothesis-free. And, and in fact, the point here of this uh, genetic screen or using genetics um, is not uh, a you versus me or a genes environment discussion, but it's really an entree into a mysterious process. What what's underlies circadian timekeeping What's the machine that keeps time? What's the quartz crystal, right? That's the idea. And so that's, that's the, uh, you know, the next few minutes of this talk. And I, just to make a very long story short and, and uh, avoid um, the, the, what, what Emmanuel did, which is to go over that, that old work, I will simply say that, that uh, our labs at Brandeis, Jeff Hall, my friend, collaborator, uh, of longstanding and the young lab at Rockefeller over a period of 15 years or so um, cloned that period gene and other circadian genes. And that gave rise to this general picture of circadian timekeeping, which is conserved in animals uh, from flies to humans. And it's, it's a very simple negative feedback loop in which um, a positive transcription factor of pair of proteins orthologs the same orthologs, despite the name change here, between flies and mammal, drive the transcription of their negative regulators. And then those negative regulators build up in concentration and feedback and turn off their own transcription. Um, the negative regulators decay. Uh, and when the concentration gets low enough, the cycle starts over again. And this takes 24 hours to go around that cycle. And of course, I'll, I'll simply state here that this is not all about transcription. There's very important post-transcriptional regulation um, that's also critical for timekeeping. And this is just sort of to set the general stage for this um, molecular sketch. Um, and so what I want to describe in, for a few minutes is what, what are the future challenges for the field? And, and one of them is a very basic science challenge what, what really are the rate limiting steps in this process? Why 24 hours? Um, why not 20 or 15 or 25 or 30? I told you that it's not exactly 24 hours. So what, what does determine the timing? And, and the second related question is how does this principle of temperature compensation or temperature independence work? And I, I will simply tell you that the circadian period um, changes almost not at all with temperature. So the Q10 is almost exact, <clears throat> excuse me, is almost exactly 1.0. And, and that's true for mammalian tissue culture cells, just as it's true for exothermic fruit flies. And so that's really a, a, an unexplained mystery, probably connected to the rate limiting step. Um, and and uh, the reason we don't know this and what I think this will require is both biochemistry, namely in vitro timekeeping system, 
with purified components and structure, both of which have been uh, accomplished in cyanobacteria, but not for the more complicated uh, animal timekeepers. And so the second challenge is really trying to leverage circadian rhythm knowledge to improve human health. And uh, I'll simply point out uh, with this, uh, I think, very handsome picture that the circadian clock has its fingers in just about every aspect of physiology, everything we do from endocrinology to behavior, sleep, um, metabolism, uh, et cetera. And so the question, uh, this begs the question of why. And the simple answer and, and leaving, uh, outside, leaving aside a lot of fascinating detail is that this core clock, this simple transcription feedback loop, regulates the cycling of hundreds to thousands of messenger RNAs in each cell and tissue where it's present. And the way to think about this is, uh, is, is like developmental, the spatial hierarchy for developmental transcriptional regulation, except this is a temporal hierarchy. And so that there are other transcription factors which are driven by this small loop and they regulate other genes and so forth and so on. And so you have hundreds of thousands of mRNAs in each cell and tissue. And then the core clock, this small little timekeeping device is present in essentially all tissues in mammals, the brain, heart, spleen, liver, kidney, skin, et cetera. And, and uh, because the downstream target genes are different in each of these cells, when you add up all these different uh, oscillating messenger RNAs in the different cell types, you come up with well more than half of the genome is under circadian control somewhere. And so that's a simple explanation why the, the effect on physiology is so broad. So what are some of the disorders or diseases we should con consider? So. Uh, there's metabolic diseases uh, like diabetes. And, and I think a, a, uh, an insight that was gained about 20 years ago into this problem that's, that's uh, not obvious, and, but very simple, is that the uh, simple top-down control um, of circadian rhythmicity, namely light, uh, impacts the eye the eye connects directly to a small region of the brain, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That then through hormonal control would regulate the timing of all sorts of peripheral clocks, except there's a sort of bypass circuit in which, in which um, food metabolites normally, of course, in sync with uh, the rest of the cycle because feeding itself, uh, feeding rhythms, the behavior is under circadian control, but these metabolites can have a direct, direct effect on um, the periphery, um, uh, on, the, on the timing of the clocks in places like the liver and in muscle. And so the implication of this, of course, is, is that what's important is not just what you eat and how much you eat, but actually when you eat, which is illustrated, I think, here by this um, paper, which was published almost a decade and now, ago now, but indicates that time-restricted feeding without any change on caloric intake and without any impact, I should say, on respiration um, of the animal prevents metabolic diseases. So if you feed mice a high-fat diet, uh, they don't get fat if that uh, feeding is done in a restricted way, in 10 hours of feeding and 14 hours of fasting. So, so this is this this uh, I, I think has implications for um, human health and also for the way some of us are are treating our food. And so, you know, here's another um, important human uh, disorder or condition that's impacted by circadian biology, namely sleep disorders. And and many of you will know that there are Mendelian sleep disorders, um, advanced sleep phase syndrome, or delayed sleep phase syndrome, which we can just consider extreme chronotype disorders. I'll, I'll say something more generally about chronotype in a, in a moment. But these are Mendelian disorders, 
people who can't stay awake, they have advanced sleep phase, or people who, who um, can't go to sleep, um, they have delayed sleep phase. And, and uh, there are four families of humans with Mendelian causes that underlie these syndromes. And these are mutations in our famous circadian clock genes, which are shared between flies and, and, and humans. And so this, if you will, uh, closes the circle in, in the genetics that began with flies ending up with um, human sleep disorders. And of course, the uh, less extreme version of these syndromes is simply uh, the category or the categorization of all of us into our chronotype, of which um, the simplest two versions on the, on, the, on the edges of the distribution are early birds and night owls. And I'm all, I'll also say something about social jet lag in this context. So chronotype, how, how do we measure chronotype, human chronotype in the field? It's done with questionnaires, which turn out to be extremely effective. When do people go to sleep? Uh, when do they wake up? Of course, one can also monitor activity either with some kind of Fitbit device or uh, even better in the lab. And uh, in a sleep lab, um, under these uh, particular regimes, which are designed to do this optimally, um, one can also measure temperature or melatonin secretion. And in fact, if one takes the um, one takes the surveys. Uh, and divides people into morning and evening type based on these surveys, then the temperature rhythms or the melatonin rhythms from uh, saliva, um, they, they clearly track with the morning types and evening types, even just from surveys. And so this, this whole, uh, these categories of uh, uh, chronotype early birds and night owls brings us to the other part of genetics, if you will, that is you versus me, and also some genes environment considerations. So chronotype, like almost everything else, is, is heritable. Um, this is just data from monozygotic and dizygotic twins. And of course, the concordance is much, much higher in monozygotic than in dizygotic twins. You know, everything is, uh, we, we, you choose to measure essentially is, is heritable. And in fact, um, at, at a, you know, about a 0.5 level. But of course, it turns out that, um, that these are many, many genes which make this contribution to phenotype as uh, to chronotype here, as is, uh, was indicated before in other contexts. And this is a recent paper from Nature Communications and looking um, at, at 700,000 people um, in the UK Biobank, who also um, assayed their chronotype, either by survey or by uh, a real uh, activity assay. And, and the simple conclusion is there are many, many any genes that contribute to chronotype. Many of them are known circadian genes. Some of those I listed previously. Um, and, and then there are some very interesting unknown genes, which also um, likely um, contribute to phenotype. And this is the concepts of social jet lag, which I think you'll find quite interesting. Um, the, the, these are sleep records from an individual over six weeks. And the barber poles here are work days. And then the two green data stripes are free days. And this is sleep time, um, five days, free days, five work days, free days. And what you'll notice of this particular night owl is that he or she goes to bed much later in general and wakes up much later on free days than on work days. And if one takes the mid-sleep uh, average from work days and from free days and calculates a difference, that is social jet lag. And of course, this is a population now of social jet lag where the average is, is about an hour of difference in mid-sleep time between between work days and free days, but early birds are over here and, and night owls are over here with a lot of social jet lag, this particular individual about three hours over here 
And one can see from sleep duration um, as a function of chronotype. So these are the night owls over here that they have big differences in how much they sleep on free days and on work days. And, and um, <clears throat> this is uh, most prominent, I think, this distinction uh, when one looks at young people because the difference in sleep duration between free days and work days is maximal um, in the teenage years, which we all know either remember from our youth or know from our uh, children. And in fact, this is really quite remarkable because people who, who um, are owls or young people, they, they are really experiencing um, dramatic jet lag, but weekly. It's as if they fly west on Friday and then fly east on Monday with several hours of difference to their sleep schedule, uh, but weekly. And so this raises the general point that, uh, to use a, a, a Spanish term that my wife likes, that, that all of us are sleep deprived or living in some anti natura state. So everybody uses alarm clocks, or almost everybody. People fall asleep at four in the afternoon during seminars. And that's sort of our our field sleep latency test. Um, falling asleep behind the wheel is a much, much bigger contributor to highway accidents than alcohol. Um, we all, all don't get enough light in the daytime because we indoor light cannot reproduce the intensity of sunlight and we have too much light at night. And so we're all now living with three different kinds of clocks. The sun clock, um, our body clock, the circadian clock, both of which are natural, but then this, this big effect of uh, society we currently live in. So let me say a few words about sleep regulation. There's circadian regulation and homeostatic regulation. This is the clock, and this is um, the homeostatic regulator is who's keeping track of how much sleep we've had and how much sleep we need. And, and this is, um, I would contend, mostly still unknown. Um, what is keeping track of sleep need? Um, how does this system actually work? And, and, and why do we sleep? Which is, of course, related to this uh, second question. What's the conserved function of sleep? And I, I'll just say that flies really sleep, and they sleep just like we do. And so maybe they'll do for sleep research what they did for circadian rhythms, and, and they will um, teach us something about um, the answers to those sleep questions. And just to point out to you that flies, in addition to um, sleep and, and activity, uh, they undergo very sophisticated sets of behavior. Um, these other things, uh, aggression, learning and memory, uh, mating and courtship, and they do this with a, a brain which is about a million times smaller than the human brain, um, and and uh, or if you will, a thousand times smaller than the mouse brain. And so the the, the sense is that we'll learn a lot uh, from studying these basic problems in the fruit fly, and it's this difference in size is really illustrated by comparing the. 150 neurons or the 75 pairs of neurons, uh, circadian neurons in the fruit fly brain compared with the 20,000 neurons in the structure in mammals, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is uh, the parallel structure in, in mammals. And I'm gonna skip over this so I have a little time at the end without being too late to once again make a few uh, both frivolous and perhaps mildly philosophical remarks. So, so I'm a great fan of model organisms and especially our favorite model organism, the fruit fly. This is Mike Young's great nephew. This is Mike here, Jeff Hall here, um, that, who drew this uh, cartoon. And just to point out to the general audience that ours was the fifth Nobel Prize for uh, the fruit fly. And I, and I want to tell you something that you might find amusing about the Nobel banquet, which um, some of you know from having attended in person. Um, it turns out that, um, that in my year, uh, all 10 of the women, of the wi winners, excuse me, that was a Freudian slip, I'm afraid, they were all men. And they were all in, uh, we were all, um, uh, let's, let's say senior between the ages of 68 and 70, 
in 68 and 85. And we got an email a month or so before the banquet telling us that um, we should take the opportunity to go to the toilet between the ceremony um, in the concert hall and the banquet in City Hall because the banquet was likely to last between four and five hours and we were not allowed to get up from the table for the entire length of the banquet because nobody can get up until the king gets up. And, and this, this, of course, sent the entire group into, uh, in, into uh, a fit of, uh, of, of anxiety because I think none of us had spent five hours of the having taken a, taking a, a leak. And so the, the, the short version of this longer story is that uh, we convinced the physicist to put a diuretic in the king's in the king's drink, so that the king would get up to pee, and then the rest of us could do so too. So I want to thank my lab. Um, this is the, this is its current uh, constitution for having uh, made <laughs> made my career possible. And and I want to I want to end in the final minutes just to say something about genetics and accidents. So I came to Brandeis by chance. I didn't know what circadian rhythms were. Um, I met Jeff Hall, who would been a postdoc for Seymour Benzer and worked next to the circadian rhythm story there. And so he taught me this and it's through my friendship and collaboration with Jeff that I learned about all of this that never would have happened had I not gone to Brandeis. And so I do want to say a little bit about genetics here and, and this uh, you versus me and genes environment question. And, and my wife uh, made, uh, characteristically, a very poignant comment one day when I was complaining about somebody who, who hadn't earned the large amount of money that they had. He simply inherited it. And she said to me, you know, you didn't earn your intelligence either. Um, and so the point here is that, that all of us are, are beneficiaries of uh, an incredible set of stochastic events from our birth to the people we meet, to the places we go work. And if one thinks about all of this uh, in this way, in, including the things that we've accomplished, I, I think it tends to undercut the sense of agency, which, which permeates um, much of Western world and certainly uh, our scientific profession. You know, I did this. And, and if you think of yourself simply as the beneficiary, as the fortunate beneficiary of good circumstance, then, then that, that not only promotes uh, humility, but I think it's necessary for a sense of empathy. Because if you really earned the good things that you've done, then it seems to me that people who are much less fortunate must have earned the much less good life that they've had. And yet, if you think of your fortune, uh, your, your accomplishments is simply the consequence of good fortune, I think it contributes to having more empathy uh, for those who are much less fortunate. And on that, I'll end two minutes uh, over time. And thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you very much. We have a number of questions that have come through from the audience. Um, so many people are wondering, you know, how, how, how does, um, the circadian clock affect our metabolism. Like, should we only be eating during the day? And I guess I would add on to that, does it really depend on whether you're the early bird or the night owl? And... So, so of course, the, the, the answer is, I don't know. Um, the, the, the logic behind this is that, um, as, as you know, Leslie, uh, the, the liver um, in particular mm -hmm goes through a really dramatic feeding fasting shift in, uh, in metabolism so that uh, there's a completely different set of proteins which are made uh, at nighttime than in daytime, you know, so gluconeogenesis at night and, and catabolism during, during the daytime. And so the, the, the idea is, of course, to match intake uh, in some way with that dramatic metabolic change. And, and so it, it just makes sense, you know, not to snack. Let's say that, let's put it that way, that your body is not prepared uh, for a slice of apple pie at 10.30 or 11 at night. 
And and I think it's it's hard to prove this. And uh, uh, I've been doing it myself for about three years. And I lost a lot of weight. Probably I eat less too. Um, but but I, I, I and, and there's there's several instances where uh, timed feeding has has ameliorated disease. You know the idea is that it reinforces circadian biology in in some way that that it's not not very well understood. So you know I, I don't think anybody can prove this. There's been no double blind trial that's been done, but I, I I bet it has no harmful effects and it's probably good for you. And I and 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 I don't know about the early bird night owl <laughs> idea, but that would be just a couple of hours anyway. Um, you know, and except in the most weirdest of circumstances. So, you know, that a little a little shift like that probably is simple to introduce. Great. Um, there's two kind of interrelated questions here. It's when your sleep cycle is interrupted for a long period, for if, instance, if you're working on a night shift or you have a newborn, does it go back to normal when that outside influence um, ends? And kind of related is, are there genetic chronotypes that have a pattern of change over a lifetime? So maybe in your 20s, you're an owl, but in your 30s, you become an early bird, and then you go back. So well, let's see. Let, let me answer the second question first, to the, to the, as, as well as I can. The, I, I, I don't know any. I don't know any stories of any reversibles. I, th I think everybody, as as the graph I showed indicated, everybody starts out earlier, uh, later, more owl-like um, as a young person, and then shifts to being earlier as they age. I think everybody's, many, many people have, um, have, have had that experience. They're always outliers, of course. But, but I think that's the, that's the general rule. And what, what was the first uh, question? Sorry. Okay. There was a first part to that and the, part question. The first part is when you're, you're going through External oh, yes, yes, yes. The, events the like a, a kid. <laughs> interruptions, interruptions in sleep cycle. So, so, so by and large, in, in animal experiments, um, there are few instances of, of uh, masking, well, when, what, we, what the field tends to call masking, which means that if there's been some long-term environmental uh, exposure to something, that, that there's a permanent change. Right, so most of these things are reversible, as every mom um, knows. Um, so you know you, you're, you're really whacked when the infant, until the infant itself, uh, he or she acquires a, a sleep cycle. So, and I think, and I think generally, shift workers go back to a normal pattern as well. Although there are sequelae from from shift work, which is not not done under optimal circumstances. Pe people are much better off rather than rotating shift work to just being night workers or day workers and then able to. I, 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 I was just, I was in the hospital for two days, you know, until, until less than 24 hours ago. And the night nurse told me that she sleeps great in the daytime and even as a kid um, had trouble sleeping at night. And so she's always on nights. She never shifts. And, and she sleeps great and always under the same conditions in the daytime. So I think, I think the, the rule of thumb is regularity as opposed to switching insofar as possible. And if you have to shift, you do it in, gradual, in a gradual fashion, you know, in, in the same sense that a, a, a two-hour jet lag is less disruptive than six hours, which is less disruptive than going from the East Coast to Asia and a 12-hour jet lag. Right. Great, thank you. We have a question in the audience. Hi, hi, Michael. Uh, yeah, it was very nice to hear your talk. And of course, um, the pandemic has uh, led people to be able to live a more natural cycle. And one thing that we have observed by studying sleep is that that has been the revenge of the night owl, that actually the night owls can at last live their normal life and you see less uh, effect of the weekend. You know, they don't have to recover during the weekend. They can sleep later at night in the morning. 
And as a consequence, when you measure their sleep, they have more REM sleep because rapid eye movements is, is also very gated by, by the circadian clock. And I was wondering if you have thought about REM sleep uh, because ever, everyone so, think about homeostatic regulation and non-REM sleep, but REM sleep, which is both very gated by the circadian clock and also, um, you know, uh, has some homeostatic uh, rebound. And I, I just, and if, what do you think about this particular link? I know I, it's not something I've thought a lot before about the link between REM sleep and the circadian clock. Um. It's a tough question because I don't think anybody has really the answer, but... I think, I think you... It was, that was a sort of... That was a... That was a, uh, a Peter Sellers rhetorical, rhetorical question because, in fact, there is no answer. You, you, as, you, as, you, as the way you posed the question indicated, I think we really don't know. People, people really don't know very much about REM sleep. It turns out, you know, aside from its, its rather tenuous connection with dreams. I mean, you know more about this than I do, and you're more of a, really more of a sleep expert than I am. So, so but um, I, I, think, I think REM sleep remains, you know, a mystery within the greater mystery of sleep, right? But I think it's one of those things, it's very hard sometimes to dissociate what's happening with sleep versus circadian. Uh, as you know, uh, and that's a really tough uh, question in general. You know? Yeah, no, I, th I think the fly, the, the fly experiment, this is, you know, a, a, a little bit esoteric, of course, for the a more general audience, but I think, I think the fly experiments in the last half dozen years, and even some mammalian, some, some rodent experiments, have indicated that the influence of a circadian clock on sleep is, is probably more important than, than we thought uh, 10 years ago. Um, and, and it may be that the cartoon that I showed you there with, with the separate regulation may not be quite so separate, let's put it that way. That's just another way of rephrasing what Emmanuel just said. Is that, is that you agree with that, Emmanuel? Yes, totally, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, Mike, this is Larry. Um, so I, <clears throat> I wanna ask about Food from Lee's question, timing of food, sleeping, circadian rhythms, as, as a question about model organisms that are not flies. So for the last 15 years or so, I have believed that the right model organism is the humans that live in Tanzania and who are the Hatsa bush people. They have zero fat. They live to be 70 or older if they don't die in the first year. They um, sleep like babies, I think, at a, from kind of sunfall or whatever you call that, when the sun goes down till the morning. And then they work the whole time and they eat all the time. They never stop eating. Admittedly, these are berries, usually, but they are basically grazers. And I wonder if instead of talking about the Hadza Bush people, there are uh, cultural or biological or genetic groups that have given you insight into this set of questions. So the, so I, I don't know anything, um, you, 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 there, there are two separate topics embedded in your, in your question. One is um, something to do with sleep and the light cycle and when people sleep. And the second is metabolism and eating. And, and um, I, I know next to nothing about the metabolism side of that particular issue you raise. I just, just I, I've actually never read a paper about either when they eat or what they eat and, and how that might feed into health. Um, but, but everything you said makes, you know, sort of, sense on first principles. It wouldn't surprise me if, and, and, if, and of course, the, 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 so I do know something about the sleep because there are in the last uh, less than five years, there are at least two or three good papers in which um, primitive tribes in South, in South America 
um, which live under no electricity circumstances uh, and, and have been compared with relatives, genetic relatives who have moved to the city, the city, you know, a small village, which is electrified. And so you, you have the same genotype effectively um, nearby, you know, 50 miles away or something. And, and one um, exposed to electric lights and one, and one, uh, and, um, and, and one living under natural circumstances. And, and there's actually also a, a, a very good camping study from, Bold, from Boulder, from, Ken, uh, from Boulder of all places, um, <clears throat> and it can write, and, and, um, and that also puts people under natural conditions. There's no question that sleep, sleep under those conditions is, is much better, longer, um, less interrupted, et cetera, et cetera. So, so where, where, the, where the two topics, so I think everyone, all, the little bit of data that exists is consistent with that kind of a sleep pattern, um, you know, being good. Um, and, and where the two might intersect would make sense to me, but you know, this is just a, this plus two and a half bucks will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. The, the uh, is of course, um, if, if, you're, if you're a long sleeper, um, because the lights have gone out and that's what you do. Um, and of course, if you have to graze for your food, you don't have a fridge uh, to go to when you wake up for two hours and then, you know, from midnight to 2 a.m. Um, which, which you might do if, you're, if you've got a long night. And, uh, but of course, you're not gonna go out in, in the dark uh, and, you know, and hunt for roots. So, so it, there's a natural feeding fasting cycle that, it, that accompanies that kind of a life cycle, lifestyle, independent of anything else. So, you know, that's, that's my sort of short way of putting those var variables together. So I think the only piece which is a complete unknown to me is is the metabolic contents of what the people consume right and and how that might feed into this the rest the rest of it sort of makes sense um, in the context that I was articulating is that is that helpful at all uh, yes great so thank you very much Michael we appreciated your provocative talk and got us thinking about food I think actually so. <laughs> thanks